Hey, is this thing on? Are we recording? Can I get a tech person? Oh, for the love of ed tech. If you're tasked with managing hundreds or thousands of student Chromebooks, you'll want to check out our sponsor, Visor. Visor is a Chromebook and IT asset management software solution designed specifically for school districts. To find out how Visor can help your school manage Chromebooks and get 20% off, go to visor.cloud slash love edtech. That's V-I-Z-O-R dot cloud slash love edtech. Or click the link in the show notes. Thanks, Visor. Joining us today is Janet Hearn, who is Senior Director of the Regional E-Campus at Miami University. Hey, Janet. Hey, thanks for having me. (laughs) Yeah, thank you so much for joining us. We're excited to talk about lots of things and hopefully maybe some e-learning things. But first, I want to know, how did you end up in education? I happen to be an alum of Miami University, so I went there not knowing what I wanted to do when I grew up. Mm -hmm. I'm still trying to figure that out, by the way. Me too. Okay, cool. Me too. (laughs) So I kind of took a medical technology road, and then I came across a wonderful mentor. His name is Dr. Bill Houck. He was the chair of the physics department at the time at Miami University, and he told me I should teach physics, and I said, what? What? Really? So, yes. And so trying to keep it short, everything fell into place. I had to take an extra summer of school, but I ended up getting a physics degree from Miami and then going into graduate school for education. And my plan was to teach physics in high school. But what happened was they needed an instructor at during grad school at Miami Middletown, one of our regional campuses in Middletown, Ohio. And I taught night classes and fell in love. I fell in love with the students. I fell in love with the campus. And I ended up being eligible to apply for tenure there. And I became a senior instructor of physics at Miami University. So that was okay with me. I could bypass the spitballs and some of the shenanigans. And I had great students that you know, they were paying their way through college. They were doing it at night. They were doing it when they could. They had dreams of being engineers, physicists, teachers, all kinds of different things, pre-med. And I had the pleasure of teaching them physics. And my whole focus when doing that is they came in the door. I can't do this. This is hard. Physics is a mystery. I said, it's really not. You can't walk across the floor without physics. You're, you're doing physics all day, every day. And it's really not that complicated. And my plan was for them to leave loving physics and loving the appreciation of the world around them through kind of the physics eye. I promised them all they would have a physics dream before they finished my (laughs) class. And they all said they did. Sometimes it was a nightmare, but you know. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And I promised they would have a meal with friends or family where they would all look at them and go, what? what are you talking about? Why are you telling us about this, that, or the other? They usually said that happened too. And so (laughs) Mm -hmm. that was my whole, you know, goal was to, to turn attitudes around A, a hard subject or a seemingly impossible goal was made, was made possible. And they looked at the world differently when they, they got done with my class. So that was my, that was my goal. Yeah, which is a good goal when I you teach a subject such as physics that's specialized like that. I mean, yeah, it's just we don't talk about physics a lot in K K twelve, so people just think it sounds fancy. It sounds fancy. Yeah. Well, it sounds scary. No, yeah, not accessible. <laughs> right. I right. love physics was one of my favorite classes in high school because yes. I mean I I love math so but we had a teacher that was just so engaging and excited about it that it was, we had a lot of fun. So yeah, I, I I get excited about it and we did have a lot of fun and it was, I did that for about 23 years and then I transitioned. I really like technology and teaching. And so I transitioned into how can you teach better with technology or how can you enhance teaching with technology? I did some flipped classroom work and then moved into developing online courses and 
now I am oversee the online programs and, and course development and marketing and support for online students at the regional campuses of Miami University, which is also a super fun gig. Yeah. Is, what does that entail in itself? I'm kind of curious, like... Well, yeah, there's a lot to it, right? Yeah. So there's, we have kind of four arms to our team. We have an arm, the original arm was, you know, develop online classes. So I started instructional design and working with faculty to put their courses online. And then there's a faculty support arm. So, you know, you have trouble, you need a help desk, you support while you're teaching the courses. So we developed that arm and that arm has grown to where they do research in online education. They do professional development for the faculty. They do articles that people access nationally. So that's grown and really cool. And then the interesting piece was we hadn't developed a student arm and a lot of e-learning offices don't develop a student arm. But when you think about it, we're here for the students. So we developed a student arm that has grown to be kind of our, they're the liaison with all the student offices to make sure you can get tutoring, advising, admission support, all of that online if you never come to our campus. So we had to make sure those were in place. We kind of oversee the marketing pieces of all the programs to make sure everybody's aware of us and how can they get in touch and how can they engage with us. And then finally, we have our latest piece is kind of our outreach community piece where we're working with industry and different partners to develop micro-credentials. So we're trying to do bite-sized learning nice. with, with yeah. two or three courses to let people kind of sample college if they're not sure if that's something they need or want, but it's based around skills. So rather than have some mystery kind of degree. I'm not sure what that is. It's based around skills. And so when you go have that conversation with your em employer and say, I have some college credit, you can actually show them digital credentials that list all the skills and list everything that they got out of those credentials. So now you're having a conversation about skills rather than I have some college credit. Yeah. You can show them right. what the skills are. Yeah. Right. So we've yeah. grown, we have about 20 employees within our team and and we've grown to to do a lot of different things at Miami and and we're it's it's a super fun thing as well like I love it it's different every day so that's cool why do you think keeping it fresh that's important in education well education i think we're all aware now is changing the the face of education is changing covid kind of shined a light on that and said you may have to do things differently sometimes, or you may have to look at education differently. And that's kind of what our team likes to do. So honestly, our focus is access and equity. So how can everyone access education? College doesn't have to be that thing that, oh, I'll never do that, or I'm not supposed to do that, or I can't afford that. Everybody should have access. So we're trying to make it accessible with our online opportunities. So, you know, if you're, if you're place bound, if you have family, if you have work and you can't access the, you know, typical residential college experience, we've got options for you. If you're, um, you have superpowers, you know, dyslexic, blind, hard of hearing, deaf, you need to have access to education in higher ed, and we want to make sure you have that. And so we really work hard to make our online courses accessible as much as we can. How do you make those things happen, those accessibility pieces? I think a lot of people don't know, and so it, it's kind of intimidating, right, just like physics. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Just <laughs> it all comes back to physics. It all comes back. To <laughs> I like those hard problems to solve. That's mm -hmm. yeah. ultimately, you know, when people say, why'd you go into physics? Well, it's not physics per se. I like hard problems to solve. I like to get paid mm -hmm. to play with expensive toys. So I kind of look for opportunities to solve hard problems in different ways, but it's really not that intimidating. So you have to look at the course materials, videos, you have to make sure they're captioned and they're captioned properly. They have transcripts. Some of them they need descriptions. So if you're blind, you can hear the video, right? But you may not see what the action happening or you see the PowerPoint slides or whatever they used in the video. So you have to provide a description of what's going on in those, in those videos. Make sure all 
printed material, printed, right, quote unquote, like that you might download or that you access digitally is friendly with a screen reader. So you have to be able to do that. You have to make sure that colors have good contrast. So if people are colorblind, they can see the contrast. So there's a whole host of things and there's a lot of great organizations out there that provide guidance to make materials accessible. We also use a, a learning management system that we that has plugins that a student can click to get an accessible version of pieces oh, nice. and parts often so that it's easy for them to grab it the way they want it. We like to give choices. So if you want to watch the video, great. If you're like, I hate watching video, I can't be that attentive. Maybe you want to just scan the transcript. So can we provide that? So it's just being aware of kind of those different different ways you can make materials accessible as well as provide choices to students so they can access the material that works best for them. There's whole conferences about accessibility and education, and we send people to those. And we, we, we've actually started providing some workshops for companies or places that do instructional design so that they can be up on the latest, greatest with accessibility. But we try to make every course, we complete every course before it's offered. We don't just start teaching it and then, well, the next module is not due till next week. So we'll just do it. Now, the whole course is complete. It's peer reviewed and it's checked for accessibility before it's ever offered the first time. Wow. That's really great. What kinds of numbers of people are taking online courses now? So for for us, we've got approximately, so about 75%, about 3,500 students take at okay. least one online class at the regional campuses. Okay. And we have about 1400 right now that take exclusively all online classes. They're not taking any face to face. And we have students in Columbus and Cleveland in all different places participating and taking our online classes. So it is a, it, we have about 50, 50 credit hour generation online versus a, a face to face version of the classes. So it's pretty significant at, at Miami regional campuses. That's Sorry. huge. Yeah. I wouldn't have expected 50, 50. Yeah. Well, part of that's due to COVID. So, well, that's what was the next question is, <laughs> did you notice an increase in that? Well, so for COVID, we had to develop some remote courses. So the ones that weren't developed as online had to go remote and mm -hmm. remote classes are different from online, online or planned out before they're even offered remote. You're kind of doing the same thing you did in class, but you're now broadcasting it. So everything was remote or online, right? During COVID. And then as we've started to transition back, the percentage of online has has been dropping back. We were about 40% of our credit hour generation was online prior to COVID. Now it's it's a it's 50 50 and may drop a little bit back more towards the 40. So as we get more and more students back on campus. But I feel like the students that experienced some remote or online during COVID went, wait a minute, this is kind of good. I kind of like the convenience. I kind of like the opportunity. And I think more people are, are more open to the possibilities. Yeah. It's not as intimidating. Right. I but guess. We just have to explain to people, you may have done remote in high school, which was an emergency. Yeah. If you do online with us, trust me, there's a plan. The course is all there. Yeah. It's all ready to go. Because <laughs> some people are like, I'll never take remote again. Okay. But, well, that's different. So. Yeah. <laughs> It's, yeah, not survival mode anymore. Right, <laughs> no. right. And a lot of faculty have a new appreciation for it as well, so. Oh, I bet. As students are looking at their future journey after K-12, is there any advice that you would give to people as they consider their options? I would say explore all the options and opportunities and also think down the road. It's very hard to think down the road. So when my parents, when my mother was like, you can do anything you want after you get your degree, but by God, you're getting that degree. So I was like, okay. So one of my dreams was to be a firefighter or paramedic, but she's like, no way you're going to go to college. So as soon as I graduated with my and I got my job at Miami, <laughs> I was a volunteer firefighter paramedic. So I did it anyway, but I had that foundation and I, I had choices. So I always say, 
have an A or B plan so that you have options. So higher ed doesn't work out for me. I do firefighting paramedic, firefighting paramedic. I get hurt or something. I do teaching. So try to have options is what I would first say, but, but look at all your opportunities. If you get a good job right out of high school and you're like, why would I go to college? Consider taking college classes while you're working that job, because then you have a B plan if that job doesn't work out and they paid for it. So you don't have a bunch of debt. If you get some scholarships and opportunities to go to college, do that. If you can do study abroad, do travel on the school's dime or on as part of that package, do that. Take advantage of the opportunities before you keep doors open. I feel like a lot of young people close doors and you may today say, I don't need college. I don't want college. Great, but keep your GPA up, go get a good job, work hard and keep that door open so that you have that opportunity later in life. Or you can get a, like I said, an employer to pay for it. That's like super bonus. Keep the doors open. Maybe that's not your choice today, but don't get that door slam. Don't blow your senior year, blow your GPA because you're not going to college. And then in five years, you're like, oh my God, why did I do that? I can't fix that now. So it's just about keeping doors open to me and, and A or B plans and really talk to a lot of different people in your life that took different paths and, and find out, was that, was that good? Or what do you regret? What would you have done differently so that you don't walk the same bad path potentially. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's good advice. It was hard when we were getting ready to go to college, but I know it's even harder now because there are just like so many things that you just don't even know exist. Like we meet people all the time that you hear what they do and you're like, that's real. Right. <laughs> right. That's a, thing you know, you pay yes. For. Like Sweet. that's a job, Yeah, you know? Right. So yeah. I was just mm -hmm. curious what's your yes. explore. Yeah. You got to explore. You got to Google, you got to YouTube, you got to check all the check. different things out. So yeah. And what a better time when you're young and, and you have options. Yeah. Yeah. Cause like we said, we're still trying to figure out what we want to do when we I grow know. up. I can't wait to figure <laughs> it out. <laughs> oh gosh. Teachers, you can now earn contact hours toward grad credit for listening to the podcast. Visit for the love of edtech.org for more information. Well, if you want to talk fresh and new in education, I think teachers K-12 are, are, are burnt out. They're tired. I think COVID took a toll. And I think, you know, I, I hope the teachers out there can figure out ways, you know, change it up, maybe do a flipped classroom or do something new. But if teachers can find ways to mix it up because I don't, I don't want to see all our teachers leaving K-12 are, are great experienced teachers, but I also know they're tired and they're getting some students that maybe have some gaps and holes because of COVID in their education. So just trying to keep it different, keep it real, you know, start playing, playing music during study times or mix it up a little with your students because it'll mix it up for you too. Yeah. Just I think trying that's to, great advice. Just trying to do something different because we need you teachers and I know you're tired and I know it's hard, but we really need those great K-12 teachers to hang in there. And, and I hope, I hope a lot of people look at, at subbing. If, if you're interested in the classroom or interested in checking that out, you know, trying to get some good subs in there right now while this, there's a shortage and helping out with that. What a great way to explore too. Cause I'm, I, I subbed nice. for a year and I loved it. And it would, it's, you know, it's such a great way to like dabble in different areas and different grade levels, different schools. And they're all different. So yeah, I've done I some age that. groups where I'm like, I'm never going to teach again. Yeah. And then I've gone just a couple of levels up or down and I'm like, well, mm -hmm. I, I can do this. This is awesome. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I just think totally different you world. have to yeah. check it out and try it out. Yeah. And we have to appreciate yeah. our teachers and raise them up and give them support and so that they they can mm -hmm. hang, hang with us. We need you. And yeah. uh, higher ed is, is changing. Higher ed is the face of higher ed is changing. Not everybody wants to spend four years. Not everybody wants to spend two years. The research is still there. You, you should get a better paycheck at the end of the, of that journey, but 
you know, maybe you don't take it in four years, you take it in six, or maybe you take a year off and explore your options and then come back. I, I think as long as you don't close the door, you're in good shape. But there's there's still a lot of value in higher ed, but I think we owe it to our students to kind of innovate and look at some different ways they can access higher education and realize there is a large group of people that can't access higher education and we need to fix that. That's unacceptable. So we need to figure out ways that everyone has access. Yeah, for sure. Because really, honestly, it is like a experience, not only educationally, but it's like a personal growth opportunity. Because I feel like my parents wanted me to go to college, not really for the academics, mm. but for the experience of being around right. the world. I mean, you know, right. it's all different like, types of people. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And really that was yeah. what was kind of most important for them was just the exposure and like the life experience because it does, yep. it changes you and you are, you know, you, you are different and you have different experiences than others. And Agreed. Well, you, it's yeah. a, it's a very, yeah. you meet a lot of different people in a short amount of time in a small amount of space. And that really makes you appreciate Mm -hmm. and, and makes your world, I think, grow quickly. So I, I agree with you. That's, that's interesting. That was their focus though. Yeah. She didn't tell you she never graduated, but she had a great time. <laughs> yeah, <Chicago>. exactly. <laughs> Top secret. <no. laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I think too, because I grew up in such a small town. Mm. I mean, my, I've said this before, but like my graduating class, there were only 79 of us and we were the biggest class in the high school. Wow. You know, so I think that was also, yeah, part of it was... We got to get her out. Yeah. Let's get her yeah. out. This is not good. She needs to be out in the world. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, but they were also really good at, you know, traveling. Like we traveled a lot when I was little because both my parents were teachers. So our everybody's, I was like off you. For the summer. Yeah. <laughs> you thought everybody's parents were off for the summer. But yeah, so... Anyway, that's a side note. Okay, so back to it. Flipped classroom. Yes, I was curious to get your take on how a flipped classroom works and how to make it successful. Great stuff. Okay, so at least at, at the higher ed level, we tend to stand in front of our students and talk mm -hmm. <laughs> or right. Lecture. lecture, quote unquote. <laughs> so, yeah. but I can do that on a video. Like I don't. And I can do it. So I, what I discovered was the 50 minute lecture was like six minutes when I just did it straight up on the video or 10 minutes. And I'm like, wow, what That's am I, interesting. why am I telling them for the other 40 yeah. minutes? <laughs> they're, side, they're trying to sidetrack you or something. No, I'm probably telling bad jokes. So that that's really not necessary. So, so I would, I would do this content in like, you know, like I said, seriously, 10 or 12 minutes. And I'm like, holy cow. So they don't need me for that. I mean, they need me, but they don't need me to be there. So mm -hmm. I would record the videos and I, and you can do even audio if you don't want to be on video, but now it's so easy. When I did it, it was like a kind of a major thing, but now you just boom, go. Yeah. Yeah. Do it. And so they can watch that content. They can get your wisdom out of your head pretty quickly, efficiently, and they can replay it. So it's mm -hmm. more accessible. So if you're a processor, if you have ADHD, if you're, you know, you're back on my first sentence and I'm five minutes down the road and you haven't heard anything I said. So you can go back and listen. You can take some notes. You can stop, start. You can eat your lunch if you want to, whatever. You can, it, you're, it's more flexible for you. So I did that. I posted those. But then when they got in class, we went over examples of problems and or they worked on their homework, quote unquote, their homework. So most of the time people need me when they're at home at night trying to do this quote unquote scary physics problem <laughs> and, and they're frustrated and they're mad and they took 45 minutes and they still don't have an answer and they give up and they quit. So I had them bring that. I had them come and do that in the classroom and they worked in groups often or they could work alone, whatever they preferred, but they work through the problems. And then if you get stuck, you just, Hey, I'm stuck and I can come 
show you the way, or I can give you hints, or we can have, talk it through. But when you're at home by yourself at your desk in your bedroom, you just get frustrated and mad. But if I can answer your question quickly, then you're on yeah. your way again. So that was just so much better for my students. And um, it was interesting though. Sometimes they would be like, you're making me think. I'm like, yes, <laughs> goal achieved. <laughs> But they would get, so, usually I just sit here and listen to you. I'm like, well, you know, those days are over. So yeah, <laughs> they actually had to think and work together and, and problem solve. And what I, what I would let them do is while they listened to the lecture, they could take as many notes as they wanted at home. You know, they listened and then they could bring those notes in. And then I would do a, like a, just a quick quiz at the beginning of each class to make sure they watch the video, but they could use all their notes. So if they took good notes some would come in with volumes of more notes than they ever took when I was lecturing. And then they would, interesting. and then they would rip through the quiz and be like, all right, let's, let's go, let's move on. So that's what I would suggest. You, you have to have some, you know, accountability. So either have the a little quiz or have it, let them make, take notes that they can use later in, in some other effort. And, and now it pays off for them, right? It pays off for them and pays off for you. And then, then they get stuck in class. I can help them. I can move them along. And so at home, they're doing things they don't need me for. And now they're doing the work they need me for in front of me. So, and I'm there available. So once I started thinking like that, I kind of thought, why are we teaching the other way? Cause that's kind of dumb. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Makes so much sense. No offense I know. to the people that don't use flip classroom. <laughs> Yeah, but no, I mean, too, success wise, do you think like they were taking away more? Yeah, I mean, I definitely think they took away more. I definitely think they they th had to think more. They you mm -hmm. could see mm -hmm. actually were getting frustrated a bit because they were now having to be active participants in their learning educational process learning. instead yeah. of I can just sit here and she doesn't even notice that I'm doodling and that I'm not listening and which you know, I said, that's your choice. You don't, you don't want to listen. I'm not gonna make you listen, but yeah. And I didn't it. waste their time. I didn't, they were like captive audiences to listen to 40 minutes of, I don't know what, cause I was already done in 10 minutes with the real learning. Yeah. The re <laughs> <laughs> and the other piece we could use that for was demonstrations and lab work and like hands-on type of activities, which I you know, I can't hand them a kit, to, a whole kit to take home every night to play with these things, but I could let them play with stuff in class. So it just worked out better, much better for me. And I, I think for them, they seem to enjoy it. And, and uh, it was a little hard though. Cause right. It's a, it's a change. It's a, mm -hmm. sure. It's not what they're used to. And they, they got, I heard about it sometimes. <laughs> yeah. There's a little bit of training I'm sure involved and, and trying to have an open mind to a new new way of doing things. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, and I think it would be good just to start with like a single lesson, see how it goes. And exactly, you know, mm -hmm. cause it's, it is, I mean, for you to sit and make videos, it's a commitment, put, it's a commitment and it's a lot of upfront work for the instructor. Yeah. But it also kept me from, I mean, you're doing the same lecture, right? Like mm -hmm. year after mm -hmm. year, after year, yeah. after year. And once you can can that, as long as it's not a topic that, you know, Newton's laws, gravity, still gravity, things are still falling. So right. I was yeah. good there for a few years. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I, I like the idea of it too, because like if you're teaching multiple sections mm -hmm. of the same thing, sometimes when you are reteaching that lecture or whatever, you kind of don't say the same thing every time, or you're like, feel like you already talked about that with this class, but you didn't. And, and it's just also, it's like kind of for me, like sucks the energy out of me if I am doing things on repetition, like Exactly. We always say our first takes our best take and everything after that's just kind of, yeah, the jokes <laughs> got worse though. later in the day. Yeah. And, yep. Yeah. No, yeah. I agree. And, <laughs> and it keeps it, if you do your best take your freshest work in that, in that video, everybody's getting the best of mm -hmm. you. You're mm -hmm, exactly right. right. Instead of the class at the end of the day, getting tired, Janet, that yeah, thought she already told you all of this and I'm skipping that, skipping that. And then they're like, oh, mm -hmm. we never talked about that. And you're like, oh yeah, we did, but yeah, <laughs> you didn't. And you did, but they did. <laughs> right. Yeah. So it's, it's much more consistent. It's much less, less taxing for you to, yeah, remember everything and repeat it for the nth time. And then after, you know, like I said, I did that for about 23 years. So 
whew, that gets old. So mm-hmm. yeah. yeah, keep it fresh. Keep it real, well, real. <laughs> <laughs> keep it new. Keep it fresh. Yeah. So that real. that was it. I think it's a great yeah. model, and I yeah. encourage. Like you said, you could try it with a lesson. Try it with a couple lessons. If you and the students have a good reaction, then over the summer, you can, you can do a bunch of videos and uh, get it all set up and ready to go and then launch it next year. Yeah. What would you say to teachers that are hesitant to flip their classroom because of all that upfront work, or they think it's not going to be as effective? Anytime you try something new, one step at a time, but new also helps you freshen things up. And Mm -hmm. if you're kind of feeling, like I said before, if you're kind of feeling little down with teaching and things are feeling a little rough around the edges, it could help renew you to maybe try Mm -hmm. a different technique or a different tactic. And again, you could do it just one time, one Mm -hmm. lesson, like you said, the other piece that comes in handy is if you're out for some reason, you can actually just have the, Mm -hmm. the sub or whoever's taking your class, just play the video for them. If that's the easiest thing to do, or you can, you're, you're still, if you've posted it in learning management system, it's out there and they can watch it and, and they should develop a habit of, Oh yeah, we just get in our groups and start working and we'll, we'll let you know if we need you. And (laughs) so you still know your lesson is being taught consistently because you taught it, you recorded it. Whereas if someone else teaches it for you, you hope they said everything and you hope they did it. But oftentimes in my experience, you just reteach it anyway just start recording a couple of them. And again, you're going to be surprised. You're gonna have your notes there. You're going to go through it. You're going to go, wow, that's my 30 minute lesson. I just did in six minutes. Holy cow. (laughs) Which is ideal, really. I mean, because you don't want it to, you don't want it to be 30 minutes. Can you imagine watching a 30 minute? And they're used to learning online now. They're used to learning from videos. They learn all kinds of stuff on YouTube, TikTok. They're, they're they learn doing everything it, so. from videos. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't have to be fancy. Yeah. You're meeting yeah. them where they are. Right. Just kind of meeting them. Yeah. It doesn't yeah, have to be great. fancy. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Well, and honestly, really, you can do it. I feel like you could do it with mm-hmm. any grade level. Absolutely. You know, K all the way up. They all know yeah. how to watch the phone. So they're yep. good. They've got it. Yeah. Well, thanks for talking to us, Janet. Well, this has been, this flew by. This has been a pleasure. Yeah. Uh, I I love all these topics, so I appreciate you having me. Yeah. Anytime. Thank you for joining us. We hope you enjoyed our discussion today. If you like our podcast, please don't forget to subscribe to get notified when new episodes are released. For more information about our podcast and to access links and resources referenced in this episode, check us out at fortheloveofedtech.org.